Okay, welcome back. So, hopefully you've already watched our, our previous videos of just kind of the basics of hypothesis testing and an example of a full hypothesis test there, and you're pretty familiar with those steps. Alright, so now we're going to get, dive a little bit deeper into hypothesis tests and, and kind of some of the finer points there. Okay, so the we've seen the steps before. Right, we know what to do here with hypothesis tests. We, we state our hypotheses. There's two hypotheses, null, alternative, three types of tests, left-tailed, right-tailed, two-tailed. Right, and then we, we state our significance level. We calculate our test statistic. This is where we actually use our data. Right, then we evaluate that data either using our critical value method or our p-value method or both. And then we, we draw our conclusions. Okay, so you should feel pretty comfortable about just carrying out a basic one sample Z hypothesis test by these steps at this point. Okay, so questions that may arise from that, the big thing is when we're making our decision, there's, there's two different methods that we could go with, the p-value method or the critical value method. All right, but which one is maybe better, which one's preferred, and will they always lead us to the same conclusion? All right, so we'll answer that question. Um, and when we're talking about preference, which one might be preferred, we're going to look at a couple ideas here, statistical significance versus practical significance, and the American Statistical Association's views on that. And we'll look at, well, could we potentially get this thing wrong? Right? What ways could we get it wrong, and, and how do we quantify that? Okay, so let's start by thinking about these two different methods. So as we're going through our steps, remember we, we state our hypotheses, we state alpha. Next step, calculate our test statistic. Okay, so once we have our test statistic, we, we've calculated that test statistic from our data, it's time to use that data to evaluate that data, start to make a decision. So let's just think about the critical value method first. All right, we take alpha, we take the type of test that we have, that establishes our critical value. All right, then from our critical value, we, we establish our rejection region, right, and we see does our test statistic fall in our rejection region. All right, that's, that's the critical value method, and, and some people like that method because it's, it's a little bit more visual method. Right? I'm, I'm drawing a picture of this rejection region, whatever that might look like. So, so some people, it's, it's pretty cut and dried, and a lot of people prefer that method. All right, let's think about the p-value method. So my p-value is based on my test statistic and the type of test that I have. All right, then once I find my p-value, I then compare that to alpha. And I see, is my p-value greater than alpha, less than alpha? All right, so when we're thinking about will they lead us to the same conclusion, Maybe you're kind of seeing from all these arrows, sort of just looks like a crayon threw up here, but we see that we're kind of in a big, we're kind of in a big circle, right? So either I'm comparing this test statistic directly to my critical value, which was based on the type of test we had in alpha, or I'm comparing my p-value to, directly to alpha, which was based on my test statistic and the type of test that we have. Okay, so really, we're comparing the same thing here. Okay, so since we're essentially comparing the same thing, why does it matter which one is which? Well, I think it's nice to do both. And as I mentioned, the critical value method is a little bit more visual. So if you kind of, as you're, as you're, if you're a visual person, as you're learning these ideas, right, it might be good to do the critical value method first, then the p-value method. Right, but in practice, the p-value method is preferred because, well, think about your your critical value method, right? I, I look and see, okay, does my test statistic fall in my rejection region? If so, yes, I reject. If not, fail to reject, right? But my p-value method, I'm comparing it to alpha to say reject or fail to reject, but our p-value method actually gives us a number that tells me how emphatically I reject. Right, so let's let's think about that. So let's say alpha is 
0.05, our, our most typical value of alpha is 0.05, and say I get a p-value of 0.04, right? Well, alpha, well, alpha is bigger than my p-value, so I'm going to reject here. But what if I had a p-value of 0.00001, really, really small p-value? All right, even though both of these, yes, I would reject. Okay, I would reject this much more emphatically than I would this one. All right? On the other hand, you know, what if I had a p-value of 0.06 versus a p-value of say 0 0.82? This is a really, really big p-value. We're not even close to rejecting. Right, this is really good evidence for the null hypothesis, that the null hypothesis is true. This, it didn't quite meet that alpha threshold, right? but that's still a pretty small p-value. Okay, so both of these, I don't reject, I fail to reject, but these evidences are very different. These evidences are very different. Okay, so a p-value, not only do we know reject, or fail to reject, right? It also tells us the emphasis of rejection or failing to reject. All right. So when when used correctly, p-values can be much more useful than the critical value method. Okay. Now some other things to remember when we're going through a hypothesis test. This is a, a good decision-making process if we do it right. Okay. But just because we find something, right? We find some sort of statistical, statistically significant evidence in our test, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that we need to implement these these changes or whatever decision we might be making, right? Like I already kind of kind of talked about this already, but now say we have two p-values that are on either side of alpha, a 0.049 and a 0.051. Right? So even though technically I'd fail to reject here and reject here, the evidence of these two samples, it's not a big difference at all. Okay, And, it, and these kinds of things can be, can be um, influenced by a lot of factors. One of the big ones that we tend to think about a lot is sample size. Okay, So sample size can, can really affect these things when we're thinking about the, um, the effect. All right, so the ASA recently, the American Statistical Association, they're kind of the, I don't know, the Jedi Council or the Illuminati of the statistics world. Okay, so they recently released a statement. Of, they got tired of seeing people misuse p-values. All right, so if you wanna if you want to check this whole thing out, um, it's it's linked in my blog, all right. But let's just let's just look at the too long didn't read of it, kind of sum all of the points up. All right. So so some of the main ones, and we've already kind of talked about some of these points, all right. But just remember the definition of a p-value, right? It's not necessarily saying one one way they're often misinterpreted is. Th we're looking at the probability that this hypothesis is true. Okay, that's not true. The p-value is the probability of observing what you did, assuming the null is true. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. All right. Um, so, and another thing, and maybe you were thinking this, isn't that alpha value, that 0.05, just kind of arbitrary? Right. So, a hypothesis testing process is a, a decision-making process. Right? But when, if we're actually using this to make a decision, just know that that, that 0.05 is arbitrary. Right? If it's a very important decision, right, maybe I want my significance level to be really low. If it's not such an important decision, and again, these, this has to do with a lot of things like sample size consideration and the effect size that I'm trying to detect. All right? But um, just, just some things to think about there. Right? We want good practices. Um, and we also, so I think number five is, is pretty important to us here as well. All right? This p-value, it doesn't 
it yes, it gives us a number. Do we reject or fail to reject rate? But it doesn't measure the effect size, and it doesn't measure the the practical importance of uh, of what we found here. Okay, so these are important things to think about when it comes to p values. The next thing we want to think about, right? We know so now we know we got to be really careful with our results, right? And we also know that with any statistical inference technique there's always the chance that we get some sort of weird sample that leads us to the wrong conclusions, right? What can go wrong with a hypothesis test, right? We're not always going to get it right. So remember our original assumption in a hypothesis test is that the null is true. We'll carry out our test, we'll decide one of two things, we either reject or fail to reject, right? But in actuality that null is either true or false. Now we may never know whether it's actually true or false, right? but in real life it's one of these two options. Our test is going to lead us to one of these two options. All right, So kind of summing all that up, it's either true or false, but our decision is either to reject or fail to reject. So if you think about it, there's actually four outcomes. All right, If I if the null is if the null is false and I reject it, right? That's good. That's how the test is supposed to work. If the null is true and I fail to reject, that's that's good too. That's how things are supposed to work. But what if the null is true and I reject it? I get a weird sample that leads me to that. Or what if the null is false and I reject it? Okay. There we've made an error. Now again, it kind of depends on the case or the or our, our context, but sometimes people ask, you know, well, what's worse, a type one error, this kind of error, or this kind of error? Well, it maybe we can answer that question depending on the context, right? But really, these are just two different kinds of error. So that's what we call one a type one and a type two. They're both wrong, but they're both wrong in different ways. Right, so type 1 error is rejecting a true null. Type 2 is failing to reject a false null. Right, so that value alpha is actually, we, we've called it our significance level before, it actually signifies the probability of making a type 1 error, the probability of rejecting a true null. The probability of a type 2 error is denoted by beta. All right, so we know Typical values of alpha are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. Typical values of beta that we like, you know, anywhere from, and it depends on what we're doing, but anywhere from 0 0.2 to 0 0.1, something like that, and even lower would be would be great. But okay, so imagine if I had a value of beta of 0 0.1 and a value of alpha of 0.1, it'd be easy to get those mixed up. So Usually if we're reporting the results of a hypothesis test, we say, okay, here's what I found. I had a significance level or alpha of, of this, and I, the power of my test was this. All right? We don't usually report beta. We usually report the power of your test. So if good values of beta are 0.2 to 0.1, good values of the power of a test would be 0.8 to 0.9. All right. So the calcul now alpha usually is something we have in our mind or that we're given in the problem, right? 0.05 for whatever reason is the generally accepted one. But beta, that's something that we have to calculate with a, a lot of other factors going on. So I'll, I'll make another video on actually calculating beta. All right, but so let's so let's think about these in some examples. So what about our criminal justice system? We know the idea is you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. All right, so you walk into a courtroom, the null hypothesis is that you're innocent. The alternative then is that you're, you're not innocent. All right, but when the, when the court makes a ruling, what do they say? They don't say innocent and guilty, right? They don't, so if we say they're not innocent, we, we call them guilty, but they don't say guilty and, and innocent. They say guilty and not guilty. It's kind of like saying reject and fail to reject. 
They're saying, okay, it's the job of the court to bring enough evidence against you to overturn the null of innocence and say you are guilty. But just because they didn't find enough evidence to say you're guilty, it doesn't mean you're innocent. right? It just means you're not guilty for now. Okay, could they make an error? Yes, courts, courts make errors, right? A type 1 error rejecting a true null right, means an innocent person got convicted. A type 2 error, that means you got away with something. You committed the crime, but you got away with it. There wasn't enough evidence to reject. Okay, so again, back to the question, well, which one's worse, type 1 or type 2? I don't know. That's, that's a little too philosophical for me, um, convicting a innocent person or letting a guilty person go free. It's not that one is worse than the other, they're just different. All right, what about a like a medical test? All right, if, you, if you're getting a test at the doctor, right, the null or the initial assumption is that you don't have this disease or condition or whatever you're being tested for. for. The alternative is that you do have it. So false positive or type 1 error, remember that's when we reject a true null. So if the null is true and you don't have the condition, but you reject that, right? Your test showed up positive, but you don't actually have the disease. All right? Could be scary, but not not fatal. All right? But again, what about a false negative? Well, that would be when I do have the disease, but it comes up negative. Again, which one is worse? Well, a false negative means you're going to go home and maybe spread the disease. A false positive, you know, that could be could cause a lot of um, a lot of anxiety on yourself. So again, it's kind of hard to get into that philosophical debate. All right, another question that we have is, well, why not just make alpha and beta a probability of type one and type two error just both really really small? Well, the issue is there has to do with their relationship. Okay, they have an inverse relationship. So any attempt to try to make alpha smaller, all of the thing held constant, is going to make beta bigger, right? And vice versa. Let's think back to our examples, right? In the in the court case, maybe maybe you're a judge and you're you don't want to you're tired of convicting innocent people, right? You don't want to see any more innocent people go to jail. So if you don't want to see innocent people go to jail. Right? You're going to make your guidelines for evidence to convict someone, you're going to make those guidelines stricter. But if your guidelines for evidence is stricter, that means that more people who actually did the crime are going to get away with it because you can't find as much evidence. Okay, Or vice versa, it's, it's a similar idea on with a false positive, false negative, that kind of thing. Okay, so So what can we do? Well, we know usually kind of the magical thing in statistics is the only way we can decrease both alpha and beta is to get a, a larger sample size. Right? Bigger samples always make things more precise and always fix everything. All right, so thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.